I am really pleased to welcome Kukwa Yomekte, is that how you pronounce that? <laughs> um, who actually found her way to Simon's Rock, I think, through contributing to the anthology mm -hmm. that Pauline Mangala and I edited. Pauline's back here. Um, <coughs> a couple of years back, um, Kukwa contributed to the anthology. She came to talk and read from the anthology for International Women's Day one year. And here she is working with Simon's Rock and organizing great events like this. Um, so I'm just going to introduce Kukla, tell you a little bit more about her, and then you guys will take it away. So Kukla Yomekbe, a native of Ghana, characterizes herself as a transdisciplinary artist. She choreographs West African dance forms, cooks a fusion of Ghanaian dishes, and pens memoirs, essays, and social commentaries. Her scholarly and writing interests lie at the intersection of race and skin color, African culture, black women's bodies, expression of voice, and non-conformance and performativity. All her work is influenced by her education and social socialization in womanist, feminist, and Africanist theories. She's the author of several essays and prose poems, which have been anthologized in African Women Writing Resistance, uh, Be Becoming Bi, Bisexual Voices from Around the World, and Inside Your Ear. Her essay, The Audacity to Remain Single, Single Black Women in the Black Church, is anthologized in Queer Religion too. So please join me in welcoming Kukwa. As we say in Ghana, welcome. Welcome to the weary heart in a weary world writing to stay alive. Here we will talk about the weary heart, the weary world, and why writing makes us come alive in the midst of all of this. I hope you're ready for the ride. Thank you for joining us tonight. I begin with um, the piece that Jenny was talking about that was published. Is this you can, I think? 10 yeah. 11. written in 2002 by <coughs> It is such an awesome feeling when you finally come to the realization that you love yourself. And I mean the whole person. The hair that is not quite straight, but not entirely nappy either. The thick or thin lips. The hips that may be too much or not quite enough. The fingers that are short and stubby or long and skinny. <coughs> I mean the whole package. As I stand in the shower washing the hair that thanks to all the latest developments in beauty products is now straight and sleek, I run my palms over it and smile to myself. I could tell the story of my life through the stages my hair has gone through. From the nappy short afro days to the days when I was trying to grow my hair to the first time I got approved for a perm for the Christmas <coughs> During those nappy days, if I sported an afro, it was not for any institution defined purpose, but rather that I had not made it to the barbershop or that I was desperately trying to avoid my grandmother's not so skillful use of the scissors. <laughs> the perm was bad for you, she said, not because it meant we were buying into the whole idea that straight was better and nappy was less beautiful. Maybe it's the one redeeming moment when my grandmother wasn't preaching on how to become white. But this, this didn't make me feel any better. I wanted a perm because that's what every cool girl at, at my school had, and darn it, I wanted to be cool too. As I rinse my hair and put in the conditioner that promises to detangle the nappies, I proceed to scrub my chocolate brown skin. And yet another thought comes to mind. My British grandmother to the rescue again, this time with lessons on how to become hygienically white. Scrub that body, she would scream. Maybe eventually some of that black will come off and you can start to look and act more like your mom and me. This would normally be followed by lectures of why my mother should never have married my father. Topped up with how none of us, my mother's children, took any of that silky, brony hair that was in our genes. Abuse? No way. Proper upbringing served with extra doses of love? Yes. 
That's how she saw it. After such lectures, I would dutifully scrub away or be scrubbed on those days when my childish hands and love for water made it impossible for me to complete the task. Little did I know that when I grew up, I would grow to hate the very vein that carries that hint of British in me. So today, recalling this history that lies behind taking showers, I slow down. I slow down the habitual and automatic scrubbing that has become an unconscious routine. I refuse to scrub away any of that beautiful chocolate brown skin. It has taken me all my life to become comfortable in the body God gave me. I am five feet seven with chocolate brown skin, brown eyes, and black hair, which now has traces of faded cherry coke color in it. <laughs> and I am thankful every day for this black woman that God created. After three years of growing my natural nappy hair, sporting braids, and having texturizers, I have finally settled for now on this bone straight, sleek hair. I'm sure it would allow me to pass for a member of my grandmother's British family. Thank you. <laughs> so that was written in 2002, which is now 14 years old. And um, I've been through a lot since then. Um, in 2002, my first year into my first graduate program, I wrote a piece about my skin color. So this is the one I just read to you. At that time, it was merely as a means of catharsis. A couple of years later, I decided to submit it to an anthology. Eight years later, I had it in my hand in print to validate the fact that writing was not just a hobby for me and that mine was a story worth telling. I believe my calling in life is to be a bridge between cultures, and I'm able to do this through my writing. In this bridging, I focus on colorism and hair, which is almost always the elephant in the room when a group of black women are gathered. Tonight, I have gathered four women of varying hues to tell you their woman's story. From Papua New Guinea, to Florida, to California, to Georgia, I bring you what the next generation is writing about. In preparing for this reading, we spent countless hours in companionship, doing writing prompts, critiquing and affirming each other's work, sipping tea, eating granola bars, and talking about women and brown skin. We wrote not so our audience would understand us. We wrote because we found it necessary to do so. We wrote to get the weariness out of our hearts we wrote to stay alive. We wrote to share with you all tonight, not to elicit sympathy or pity, or to encourage fascination with us or our cultures, or our lives, but to show another way of being woman, another her story. We ask of you to think of the kind of society that makes us necessary for us to continue writing this kind of experience. We ask of you to listen to and acknowledge these conditions and to consider what parts you play in the whole dynamic and what each of you can do in your own small way to change this fabric. Again, I extend my welcome. She looked down on her feet, toes snug, and her favorite pair of boots. They were a fiery red that matched every outfit perfectly and made her cool and confident. She could walk the streets of the city, all eyes on her, and not by an island. But she felt sick now, knowing that whenever she would go to put one foot inside, whenever she would look down at the red boots adorning her feet, she would think of this moment. His words, the way his eyes flashed under his floppy curly hair, the shine of his skin as the hot sun beat down will be forever ingrained in her memory. 
his words, how they made her feel, her own unvoiced response would linger at the back of her mind whenever she would talk to someone new. So she tucked him away under her bed and relinquished a sense of worth to the words of a childish boy. Time passed, and with his blessing, she blossomed into a mature young woman, and she met a man, lust tinged with love, and intoxicated them both. So much that they suddenly found themselves tangled in a web of limbs and sheets. You're darker than I expected. The nausea and insecurity refused to be forced out and smothered. Instead, it washed over her, leaving her weary. And she could say nothing but, I guess, and retreat. Because that one boy from so long ago had said, I can't see myself dating a black girl. And coupled with this was society saying, you're lucky you're so lucky. And maybe she was lucky. Maybe she wasn't. And it was irrelevant because she felt anxiety over any person she found interesting and wanted to pursue. But she's dressed now, and she's looking at the tips of her boots, wondering how something as sexy and alluring as skin could be considered wrong. She thinks that maybe she should stop wearing the boots because they're black, and perhaps she would have better luck wearing ones that were made out of a beige leather. A golden tan would be so much better than her lace-up dominatrix boots. And it had only been a few hours before that she was staring at herself in the full-length mirror and admiring them. She had felt tall and powerful. Now she felt small and silly, an imposter, someone who was trying too hard but was unable to mask their effort. The boots slid into a box under the bed. And since she wasn't 18 anymore, and she's beautiful, she knew it, and one day he liked her, and he told her, and he leaned in slowly, she had a request to kiss her, and she accepted. She liked him, and he liked her, but one day, they were, as they were taking a walk against the backdrop of pinks and oranges of the sunset, he turned to her and said, you know, you're not, a, you're not like other black girls, and draped his arm over her shoulder, smiling like he had given her a compliment. Her head dropped down, and she looked at her new favorite shoes. They were made of blue suede and had a wedge heel that elongated her legs and empowered her. But his words splattered mud on them. She shoved them into a box and slid them under her bed to forget them. Thank you. seen through the loose clothes that drape my body. Black woman. The two worst things that anyone in this country could be. I try to sit and make myself palatable. I read Joyce, Shakespeare, Faulkner. I listen to Bach, Mozart, and Kenny G. <laughs> I wear local $80 sweaters and hemp pants. Yet when I walk down the aisle of a grocery store, the looks tell me that I don't belong. I go home to Stone Mountain. Finding a white person there is like finding Waldo. <laughs> Different shades of brown. People who look like me. Everywhere. The people I should belong with belong to <coughs> People who should accept me. I never belonged there either. I didn't like the Bluford series or Drama High. I didn't le listen to Waka or Khalifa. I didn't wear Fubu or Shan John. I walk down the aisle of the grocery store. Their looks tell me I don't belong. Where do I belong? I'm too white to be black and too black to be white. Yet when I sit down in my room, I am neither. I am a student, a writer, an artist, a friend, a lover. But now, in front of an audience, that's a different story.
see myself in the yellow hallway. Your bedroom door is open and you're calling my name, but your voice is fragmented, sounding like static. Yet I am beside you and you say nothing. You never knew, but I still remember the morning I woke up paranoid, looking for you in the backyard, convinced that the shouting poured into last night's dream, closely breathing with the fear that was always there because I too knew what happened to us at midnight. I am with you. 
I felt far too aware of the floor, of its coldness and hardness, every time you told me you didn't know. In my mind, your shoulders were shaking under my hands, just because there could be no such thing of you being just as human as I. But I grew up to your height and nothing taller. All the holes in the walls, and the zeros and commas from the bills, and the shaking doors, and every half-empty suitcase, and the prayers in the family room that never got through the ceiling, and wondering why your son couldn't get a job, why no one ever told you because they could have just told you and you wouldn't have and you wouldn't have the life you wanted. Why you hesitate to post your picture on the internet so as not to lose business. Though we all knew the reason why and wouldn't say it. And then you were making a scene at the drugstore because no one can keep you from defending yourself. And today I am feeling sorry for feeling foolish suffered from a lack of interest in black solidarity, black women in solidarity. <coughs> but there is no way to ignore it anymore. Nothing here was intended for us, and I see it now, Mother. The red water from the rose's eyes never stops filling up. We were born with these thorns. This one's called Instruction Manual. You better know your history, because they do. Slather white cream on your hair to make it more manageable. Braid it up because it's too short. Wrap it every night. Grease your scalp. We'll give you a crown. Mother, why are my knees and knuckles darker than the rest of my skin? You can rub lime on them to make them lighter. Remember to tuck in your lower lip. Pinch your nose 20 times a day to make it pointier. Look for the shade under the trees during recess. Remember bleach cream doesn't work on sunspots. Still, you must walk with your back straight and remember you are beautiful. You better know your history because they do. Turn up the volume of Haitian music so the other cars will shake at the red light. Hang this collage of Obama on the wall and stop briefly every time you walk past it. Make sure the map of Haiti is never crooked. We paid the same amount as the whites did to get here, so this is how you raise your voice and how to lift your head. Recognize there is no need to answer or to respond. Your words are valuable. Claim your opportunities because they will hesitate to give them to you. Honor yourself by staying informed. Don't let anyone define who you are. You have lips to die for. You are not made of apologies. And don't let anyone keep you from chasing after your happiness. Mother, always your voice will sound like an angel that I will always believe in. Thank you so much. Yet, body memory 
It's hard to get rid of. So I go there every time. So I have to be gentle with myself. Writing has provided this tool for expressing the roses and thorns of my skin shape. So that was just my intro. Um, this is the actual piece. I am the dark one. I have always been dark. I'm dark on all the places that matter. Like my face, my arms, my legs, my hands, my elbows, my knees, and my feet. They give me away the most. They tell the world I don't belong in my family of light skin, fonties, and elves. Sometimes I look at the inside of my thighs and my belly, and I wonder why the rest of my body is in that shape. If my whole body was this shape, then my family wouldn't complain. Sometimes they apologize to outsiders. They say, I took after my father. But when I look at pictures of daddy, he doesn't seem that dark either. Of course, next to Ma, he's much darker. I spend a good portion of my time thinking about color and rationalizing that after all, I'm not really that dark. And that there are others who are darker than me. On the scale of Cadbury's white chocolate to blue black hacks cough toffee, I am more like a golden tree milk chocolate. I play a game with myself whenever I am in town. I count how many people I meet who are darker skinned than me. I exclaim triumphantly, in my head of course, Aha! See? There's another one darker than me. I even wince when I see them, thinking, Sorry, yo. Then I smile real wide at them, trying to make up for their pain. I know this pain because I too am dark. Okay, so maybe it's not just that I spend a lot of time thinking about color. One might say I'm obsessed with color. I think it's because my family makes me always think about it. Once I was mistaken for the maid because she was light like everyone else in the family. People thought I was the one who didn't belong. So this is chapter one. I heard you got a new maid, the woman asked looking in my direction. Yes, we did. The children's father sent us a girl from his village to help with the housework and care for Ekonam and Enyonam. The current girl is learning a trade at the seamstress in town. I stood silently as Grandma chatted with a church member at the annual church picnic. Is that the new maid? The woman said, pointing at me. Hmm. No. That's my granddaughter. She just takes after her father. Grandma said, shaking her head. Ah, uh, okay. The woman responded, still unwilling to drag her eyes away from mine. She and Grandma were standing at the steps leading to the church sanctuary. I had been coming up behind them to ask for some coins to get a biscuit. I stopped in my tracks when I heard the, women, the woman's next words. Asem ni narayer kam, obanden ne kuye tuntundam. The woman asked again, hoping to get to the matter of my darker skin shade, given that grandma and my sister were much lighter. One funny mommy na broke mini be cry. The woman continued, but trailed off. I touched my hair, knowing that's what they were discussing now. At age 10, even though I attended the international school, I had a pretty good command of my mother tongue. Hmm. I don't know how genetics worked out to spike me so badly. Shaking her head yet again, Grandma turned and noticed me for the first time. Hey, Eto now. Go get your sister. We should be heading home. Ah, go. Don't just stand there. She gestured when I hesitated. I shuffled away, upset, 
that I would have to miss the rest of the conversation. As I walked, all I could think of was finding Inyanam to see if our skin really looked that different as to warrant grandmother's disappointment. I'd known I was darker and my curls wound tighter than Inyanam's, but at 10, I didn't really know what that meant. What I did know was that being accidentally called a maid was an insult. Come on, let's go, I ordered when I was within hearing distance. Mirva, she said in her usual small voice, I'm coming. As the youngest and having been left to grandma at 11 months, Enyanam had yet to develop her own voice and preferred instead to communicate in muted tones in stark contrast to the loud voices usually present in the house. Not satisfied with the amount of time she was taking to rise, I reached down and grabbed her by the hair when I finally arrived. Hmm. So this is what they were talking about, hair. I reached in to pull it again, but her hand came up to stop me, halting mine in midair. Ow, that hurt, she blurted out as she burst into tears. Oh, be quiet, I said as I also burst into tears. I quickly sized up the situation, knowing that if I brought in my sister crying, I'd have hell to pay. She was grandma's favorite. Of course, she was lighter. Here, take this. I offered her a tissue from my purse. And this. I offered her my last piece of Wrigley's chewing gum. I hoped that would make up for pulling her hair. Please don't tell Grandma, I pleaded with a face straddling between threat and meekness. Why did you do it? She whispered. Sorry. Still afraid to wake the sleeping demon that had just traded places with me moments before. I shook my head, intending to indicate my preference for silence. Noticing that I was crying also, she reached for my hand. Let's just go, okay? Someday I'll tell you what happened. Thank you. So this concludes our reading tonight. Um, we're around if you want to chat with us afterwards. We're going to do evaluations. We do have evaluations if you like to fill them out. Okay. Yeah. So this, as Jenny said, is the third event in, in a month-long um, selection of events. So we hope you'll join us with some of the other ones. And Jenny will have the evaluations for you. Yes. Um, I, I can't resist saying that white women obsess about something about their bodies and its weight. Mm -hmm. If they're born short or if they grow up short, they easily put on weight and that becomes focus of what clothes they can buy, how much money they can spend on them, what kind of men they can attract. Yeah. So, so I, I just wanted you to know that white women obsess about things too. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Yes. I just wanted to thank you again and particularly these four women from Simon's Rock. I just think you guys are so brave mm -hmm. and that was some of the most amazing writing I've heard in years. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much.